All right, next in our series on multiplexers, we're going to start talking about the bus width of the data line, right? Rather than just having one bit for input, right, we'll have lines that have multiple bits for input. Uh, so early on in communication systems, right, a bus was used to describe uh, any sort of communication system or set of wires that transferred data between components in a digital computer system. And so most of the early buses were parallel, right? In terms of, if we look at this picture down here in the lower right, this parallel interface example means all of the data, so here, if there's eight bits of data, D0 through D7, they were all transferred in parallel at the same time, which required eight different wires, right? As digital systems grew larger, uh, dig parallel wires were not practical, putting that many wires in a system, and so a lot of communication went to serial communication where you have multiple bits transferred across on one line. Right. And computer buses can use both types of communication. Uh, printers used to use a parallel connection. Serial is used internally uh, in most systems. You've heard of USB, universal serial bus, uses serial communication. And there are multiplexers and all that are used in your digital hardware and microcontrollers. Right. All right, so what we want to do is figure out how do we create a multiplexer that has a bus width greater than one. And so if we want to go ahead and say that our system had a four bit bus width, meaning that means every input line has four bits on that input line and our output line will have to have four bits as well. We're still going to use a two to one MUX, two input to one output MUX, because we're just going to have two data lines. Remember, N is the number of select bits or control bits that you need. So two to the N is the total number of input lines. When N is one, two to the first is two, so we have two input lines. Remember with a multiplexer, there will only ever be one output line. Now the output line will have to have the same number of bits as the input lines. Right, that makes logical sense. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the multiplexers that we previously designed, right? And we're going to need four of them. We need one to handle every single bit coming through. And so this model assumes that the data is transferred in parallel. Right, so let's actually pop open Quartus here. Let me zoom in on this. All right. So in the previous lecture, right, we defined then a multiplexer. From its truth table, we said that the Boolean equation, here's our control input, select input S, S naught, here's our S naught, and it with I zero. And that is ORed with the term S, and it with I one. That was our Boolean equation. And actually, you can add text to a schematic. Uh, so we could always say that M, our output, is a function of S, I zero, I1 is equal to S naught I0, so I0, and it with S I1. Sorry, one. I, oh, well, I didn't mean to kill that, but, and I can't get it back. M is a function of S, I0. I1 is equal to S naught, S naught, and it with I zero. Sorry, that should be ORed. I typed it in. ORed with S I one. Right. And like I said, uh, right. So you can add text anywhere you want to in a schematic design. All right. So there is our two to one multiplexer. All right. All right so what we want to do then is we're going to create a symbol. In, in order to do that, this is our active schematic. We go to file, create update, create symbol files for current file. It asks us where we want to save it. I've actually already created one for this, so I'm just going to let it right over the top of it. The file extension BSF stands for block symbol file. So we'll save it. Yes, let's just replace it over what we had. It said it created it. Click on OK. And so now I've got a blank schematic here that I called MUX 2 to 1 bus input BDF. Right? We want to then input or add four of these. 
to our schematic. So insert symbol, right? When the symbol window pops open, right, we have the Cordis built-in gates, but we've added to our project. So here under libraries project, right, I'm going to choose MUX two to one. And I should have clicked on repeat insert mode. We'll need, we'll need three more of those. Uh, what we'll also need is while we're here, actually, insert symbol, right? If I click on repeat insert mode, then one, two, three, and then I can hit escape to stop adding those. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, our input signals. We're going to call them A and B. Let's go back here to the slides for a second. So we're going to build this block symbol, right, is what we just did. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw something that looks like this. So we're going to define our problem as we want a structural definition of a two to one mux. So structural means we're going to use other muxes to build a mux with a four bit wide parallel data bus. So we'll name then our data inputs A and B. And A's, A will have three bits in its signal, A3, A2, A1, A0. B will have three bits in its signal, B3, B2, B1, B0. We'll have one control signal that we'll name select, right? And the MUX output will be called M and it will be four bits wide as well. And so what we've just done is we've just laid down our four symbols. We need to add our inputs, indicate that they are a bus width of four bits wide. Our select bit is only one bit wide. We just need the one select bit. And we'll tie them then to an output line here, this bus line that's four bits wide. All right. So that's what we're drawing. All right. So let's add our pins. And we're going to right, go to pin tool. For inputs, we need A, we need B, we need select. And for outputs, we're going to need M. All right. And let's go ahead and name this. So let me, we're going to say A, no, A bracket three dot dot zero, right bracket. All right. So when you're using a schematic at capture in Quartus, when you specify a bus width on these pins, we say three dot dot zero. It's different in Verilog. Uh, we use a colon in between the two numbers, but here in the schematic, we have to use the dot dot notation. And it helps then if you open up this pin properties menu because it gives you then an example. Right. Or like it says, you could use a comma separated list of names. Uh, we tend not to do that. Right, and let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more to make this a little more visible on the screen. Let me see. Let me detach this window and make it bigger as well. All right. So same thing. B needs to be four bits wide. So B3.0. Dot dot right. And uh, I'll just call this right S for select, or we could call it select. Our output then is going to be called M3.0, right? And out here, what we can do is each one of these will have their own individual wire output. So notice that when something is a single bit wire and we draw, we have this thin wire. We can also draw a bus line. So here, if we click on this, this gets us the orthogonal node tool, which is the wire line, right? This is going to get us a bus line when we click on the thicker one, right? And so what we can do is we can tie all of these outputs together in a bus. I'm going to draw that down, hit escape. All right, and notice the bus line is thicker. Right? And if you ever have, say, a wire that you want to turn into a bus, or a bus you want to turn into a wire, you can select it, you can right click, and you can choose node line, right? And then notice it got thinner down below what I selected because that turned it into a single wire. Again, select it, 
property. Oh, select, select it, right click, bus line, and I get my thicker line. All right. So I want each one of these outputs, right, to be tied into this bus. All right, if we tie four individual lines into this bus, it will be a four bit wide bus. We need to then, because this expects a four bit wide signal, we need to draw a bus line from here to here. All right, notice then when I did that, I didn't have to select the bus tool because this was already four bits wide, it automatically gave me the thicker wire. In the same manner, if I go up here, use the crosshairs and draw something out here. Right. And here. And then here. All right. Notice then each one of these is thick. They're thick because we've specified the signal to be four bits wide, so we get that bus line. Here, this signal is only one bit wide, so we get that single node line. All right. And so there are different techniques. We could actually literally go ahead and wire S into each one of these because the same select symbol is going to control all of these. All right, because the select will choose whether or not the output flows from the input I0 or the input I1. So we could wire all the selects together. We have another option as well. We can name wires. So here we have this three bit bus. Here, if I just draw a wire, right, well, it's still highlighted. If I say A bracket zero bracket, that will automatically connect bit zero of bus A to this input. So we want to connect all the A and B zero bit inputs. Right? So B zero, all right. And here, then, right, this one will be A one. This will be B1. A2. B2. A3. B3. Okay, so we put the like bit pairs on each input line. Remember the way the MUX works, whenever select is a zero, whatever is on line I zero, in this case, we then attach all of the A inputs to line I zero, right, will be the output that flows through to M. When S is one, whatever's on line I one, which are all the B inputs, they will flow through to this particular to the output M. All right. So we can say that, right? Now here, we don't have to label these outputs. Uh, this should be M0, M1, M2, M3. If we wanted to specifically do something with those individual signals, uh, we might label them, but there is no reason to at this point. All right. But if it helps you to understand them, definitely go ahead and label something like that. All right, uh, let's see, let me reattach the window. All right, let's see if we can make this our top level. So I'm going to right click, set as top level entity. I need to make sure this one's in the project as well, too, because this depends on it. All right, if we look at the hierarchy, actually, uh, I thought it would show the dependence on there. Hmm. All right, let's just go ahead and run analysis and th synthesis. All right, so I just saw a warning scroll by that I better take a look at, right? M3.0 is missing source, but it looks like I do have to label those wires. So before I told you you could ignore warnings in the simple designs, but now we want to start to pay attention to the warnings. So 
if you want to just get rid of the green, if you just want to see the warnings, you can click on the triangle for the warning. Like I said, you can ignore this number of processors has not been specified. You can ignore output pins are stuck at VCC or ground uh, because we're not actually wiring anything to a physical chip or board. And even when we do, we don't have to worry about that with our particular development boards. And then design contains nine input pins that do not drive logic. Well, it's because we really aren't uh, doing anything with them at this time. You could ignore that. But this one, when it says a pin is missing a source, that means we need to go back and label it here, right? Evidently, it doesn't know which one should be M0, M3. So let's see, All right? So here, so what I'm doing is if you already have a wire and you need to change something about its name, I selected it, I right clicked, go to properties, right? That brings up then this properties box. And now I can say, same as my output, capital, capital M, capital M bracket, zero. Now, you could also just try highlighting it and typing without going to properties. That works as well too, and it's faster. But I wanted to show you that you can get to our properties for a wire. All right, I'm gonna save that. Let's run analysis and synthesis again. We'll see if that warning goes away. And that warning did go away. So we should be able to run some sort of simulation on this. Let's go to File, New, University Program Vector Waveform. Like, now, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to simulate all of the inputs. A is four bits wide, B is four bits wide. That means we have two to the fourth plus two to the fourth, two to the eighth unique inputs. Oh. I don't want to simulate that many. So 256, I don't want to look at each individual one. So let's just take a look at a few scenarios here. All right, so uh, uh, let's set the end time. Let's get the end time to 80 nanoseconds. All right, let's insert our node or bus. All right, here are my inputs A and B, output M, select. All right. I think I'm gonna move select up to the top. So I'm gonna, well, thought I was going to grab it and drag it. There we go. All right, uh, so for B, I'll generate a pattern. All right, 40 and doubling the clock period. So I'm generating all possibilities for B. All right, so we can see all possible values sitting there on B's line. All right. So what happens if we just keep A at zero all the time? And what happens if we keep select at zero for half the simulation and not for the other half? So overwrite clock, I'm going to choose, um, actually I'll choose 80. All right, so for half the time period, select is zero. For half the time period, select is one. Well, what we should expect, right, is when select is zero, whatever's sitting here on A, which will always be zeros, will be our output. And then when select is one, whatever's sitting there on B will be our input, our output. All right, let me save this. Waveform, simulation, run functional simulation. Pop this open. 
All right, so let's take a look here. Well, select I'll select a zero. Right. We can see our output M is all zeros. That's because whatever sitting, what's ever attached to I zero, well, we, we attached all of the A signals to I zero, input zero on every multiplexer. So we get an output of zero. Right. When B zero, oh, sorry, when select becomes one, then whatever the input is sitting, whatever B is, which is attached to input line one of the multiplexer, becomes our output. Right, so that's just a quick test, right, to show that when these two, when the select switch switches from one to the other, we get A, and the other portion we get B, right, depending on what input lines we've tied them to. We have to be consistent, right? We tied all of B to input one, we try, tied all of A's bits to input zero. All right, so that was a bit, right, that was a little bit of drawing. It takes a little bit of time to do something like that. Uh, we certainly, I don't really want to have to do that for a bus, a parallel bus that's 32 bits wide or 62 bits wide. All right. Go back uh, to the last slide in this section. Oh, oh, sorry. We could go ahead and create a, a symbol that looks like this. So if we go back here, close the simulation. All right. And we go to our schematic. All right. If we wanted to use this, say in some other, in another level of our design, if we wanted to use this and make it one of our library tools, we could say file, create update, create symbol file for current file. I'm gonna save that, it says it created it. If I went to a new schematic files, and if I said insert symbol, so under project, remember it puts our symbols for our project under here, we do this, we say, okay, let me, sorry, I'm trying to blow this up, move it over. All right, so you can see then, right, we can then create that and use that as another symbol, right, anywhere in our design where we might need a multiplexer that has a four bit data bus. That was, what this slide was showing us, uh, but we have some easier alternatives of designing this. So one alternative is that Quartus has what LPM is a library parameterized module, right? So they have one for a multiplexer that you can go ahead and define. Here, I believe I used uh, Quartus 13.1 to, to create this example of the LPM MUX which I use an 8-bit bus on the inputs. Notice the select bit for this 2 to 1 mux because 2 is the number of inputs, 1 is the number of output. Right? One select line, right? we get our 8-bit output. So that's another way that we don't have to design these. Right, We can already use what's in the library. But what we'll do in our next lecture, next part of this lecture, the next video, we'll take a look at how do we do this in Verilog. All right, so I will... See you in the next lecture. Post your questions right in the comments or discussion forum. Happy learning.